Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. So this is a uh, part two of my El Nino discussions. This recent paper, a very significant paper, has shown that the El Ninos that we're very familiar with, the Eastern Pacific El Ninos, we, that we've had in the last um, 30 years plus, we've had some. Of, we've had three of the strongest um, El Ninos, the Eastern Pacific El Ninos, in. in 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 um, the last 400 years based and we know going back uh, we use coral as a proxy to get ocean temperatures going back 400 years and that's being carefully calibrated and compared to instrumental record in more recent years so we know that the proxy is is doing a good job at giving us ocean temperatures so the most powerful uh, eastern pacific el nino occurred in 1998, the second most powerful in 82, 83, and the third most powerful just recently in 2015, 2016. But these El Ninos are superimposed on top of the climbing signal uh, from, from climate change. So the most damage to coral and marine life was the most recent one that we've had, the 2015, 2016 one. And the, but fortunately, these events are only happening about once every 15 years. However, there's another flavor or beast, another type of El Nino. Another name for it is El Nino Modaki, and it's where the Central Pacific Ocean is warm. The water doesn't, the warmest part is not off South America along the equator, it's in the Central Pacific. These events used to happen about once every nine years or so, and now they're happening about every three years or so, three to four years. Okay, so the frequency is changing, and it's, um, it's believed that this, this is likely due to climate change. So I'm gonna get right into the technical details. Um, so if you Google climate reanalyzer, and you look at sea surface temperature anomaly, Right now, okay, there's South America here. What you can see, this is in the Pacific at the equator, there's a warming here. So we're in a very, very weak El Nino now, and it's of the Central Pacific type. If we go to Earth Null School and look at the same region, okay, this is, um, this is what it's the water temperature, this is sea surface temperature anomaly, this is what it is right at the moment. And what you can see is you can see that there is hotter water in this region here, and it extends north of the equator, and it extends partly south of the equator, and there's a tongue of cooler water, which is in this region. This is um, indicative of the Central Pacific type El Nino, which is happening now about roughly every, um, well, in, the la in a 30-year period, there were nine of them. So that's roughly every every three and a third years or so, okay? Um, I have Earth Null School set for back to 2015. This is April 28, 2015. And you can see that this was when the very powerful El Nino was developing. This water was being sloshed across the Pacific. The next image, so that's, the next image here, this is, um, this is July 12th, 2015. Okay, and you can see that the hotter water is sloshing off and making its way towards uh, South America. And you can see the temperature here, you know, the temperature in these regions is, is much warmer, the anomaly. And then if we go to uh, September 2015, then you can see this is becoming a very established warm water area. This is the classic Eastern Pacific El Nino. Um, but as strong as this was, and you know this, this raised uh, global temperatures. So in February, I believe, um, uh, back in 2016, 2015, you know, we were well over the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, Paris um, aspirational um, temperature rise over pre-industrial. You know, we were approaching even 1.8 for um, another month, uh, you know, getting very close to the two degrees. So we're only a very powerful El Nino away from exceeding the, the Paris uh, temperature numbers. 
And this was uh, in January of 2016. And you can see, you know, the water has continued to move over here and expand a bit further away from the equator. And the temperature anomaly is 4.2 degrees here. You know, you can sample it across here and try to find the hottest spot. I mean, it's probably somewhere in here. Okay, so this is the Eastern Pacific, the characteristics of the Eastern Pacific El Nino. Now, this new study that has just been released, this is showing the Sunday, May 5th temperature anomaly. We get the warmth here in the Central Pacific, as I just showed you. Okay, so this study relies on coral records collected by many scientists around the tropical Pacific over the course of decades. So it's basically you, you drill cores and you get the coral skeletons, the calcium carbonate. You look at the oxygen isotopes in that and you can get an idea for the temperature over time. Okay, um, and then the different temperatures were examined using a machine learning AI technique to find out what kind of El Nino event was developing and how it was proceeding. So I showed you this image here and this shows you the global temperature, annual global temperature anomalies. So the red, um, the red uh, lines here are the Eastern Pacific El Ninos. And, and you, there's the 2015-2016 one spiking up temperature, the 97-98 one, and the 82-83 one. So this was actually the strongest El Nino in 400 years, Eastern Pacific type. This was the second strongest, this was the third strongest, but because the temperature has risen, this one brought us over a threshold and caused, you know, has, has caused massive loss of marine life and coral life. Now, if you take the ratio of the occurrence of the central uh, El Ninos, Central Pacific versus Eastern Pacific, they followed this ratio. This is from 1600 to present day. So just very, very recently, this, we're getting a spike. So we're getting a lot more of the central uh, Pacific El Nino types and versus the uh, Eastern Pacific types. Okay, and I'll go right into the paper to talk more about that. So this is the actual paper here. So basically, 27, a network of 27 seasonally resolved coral records. The isotopic um, analysis allows us to get the temperature. So let's look at the key results of this paper. Okay, so this is instrumental, um, th this is the instrumental measurements of sea surface temperature um, for the eastern type El Ninos here, and this is this is so an eastern type El Nino is occurring here. And here is the central Pacific type. So you'll notice, you know, not only is it warm here near the equator, but there's a band of warm water up to here, and there's a band here, and there's a cold, cold tongue of water here. Okay, so this is characteristic of the second type of El Nino. Now, the proxy, the data from the coral is sampled at all of these different locations. The red locations are where the water temperature was warmer, the blue ones where it's colder. Then you can reconstruct the temperature across the Pacific, uh, going up to about 30 degrees um, latitude from the um, equator, and you get this. And this matches very nicely with the instrumental record. And this is the data for um, the, the central type El Nino. And if you compare the proxy data from the coral, it matches very nicely with the instrumental record. Now we have the proxy data going back 400 years. Um, so this is just some, uh, a comparison you know, of the two, a statistical comparison, again, showing good match between the, um, the, 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 the uh, let's see here, um, that's E. Um, the gray bars are the, instrumental and the coral is the black line and again we get a good match here so we're pretty confident that um that we can get the um get a 400 year record from the, the proxy data now this is a progression of el ninos 
So this is the Eastern Pacific one, progressing June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. So this is the progression of the Eastern Pacific El Nino and the strength, relative strength, and this is a progression of the Central Pacific, Pacific one. Not as strong, okay, and the progression follows different types of patterns. This is another one uh, of it here. These, this is the, this is a one index, um, the cold tongue index, and then the, the warm pool, warm pool um, index. And uh, you can see the development here in the different regions. Um, and this, com this is the instrumental, and this is from the choral. So you can compare the, them here, and there you get good comparison. Once again, another indication that we're on the right track. Um, some more comparisons using, you know, to show that the method is accurate. Now, this is the key finding here. This is the number of Central Pacific events per 30-year period. You know, we start at 1600 and we go to present day. And what you can see is that the, um, basically, this is the Central Pacific event. So we're getting a rise here, a recent rise here um, just in, 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 in the last number of decades, the re a recent rise here. So th these CP events, Central Pacific El Ninos, are happening much more frequent now. They're happening every three and a third years instead of every nine years. This is the number of the Eastern Pacific El Nino events. And what you can see is recently, coinciding with the increase in Central Pacific, we're getting a decrease in the number of Eastern Pacific. And these are the really powerful ones. When you take the ratio of the Central Pacific to the Eastern Pacific ones, you get this uh, hockey stick curve here. You know, a very significant um, rise. So we're getting a lot more of the Central Pacific El Nino events and fewer of the Eastern Pacific events. And if you look at the amplitude of the events, um, this is the, the purple lines are the Eastern Pacific events with the strength over time, over the last 400 years. And what you can see is, look at the strength here of the 1997 one. You know, it's the highest. It's much, much higher than anything else in the last 400 years. Next is the 1982 El Nino event. And then in third place is the 2015 event. Now, if you look at the Central Pacific events, um, there's a little bit of increase in strength, but they're not on the same scale as the Eastern Pacific events. Okay, so this is the most significant result um, from this. This uh, so basically, um, so basically, I want to uh, summarize. So the El Nino has huge implications around the entire planet. Okay, so one of the things is that when there's a very strong El Nino, for example, there's lots of Pineapple Express um, atmospheric river events coming to California causing, you know, torrential rains and landslides and things like that. Um, that's with the standard uh, Eastern Pacific type, type El Nino event. So there, there's, I showed you the video from the Australian meteorology people showing how Australia was affected with the strong El Nino, you know, drought in Australia with a uh, La Nina, the opposite. There's, uh, you know, lots of rainfall and cyclones in, uh, in Australia. There, there's global implications via teleconnections of these El Nino events. And this, this study now is a very solid study, very, very well done, very carefully, careful analysis. And it shows that the nature of the El Nino events are changing. And in the last number of decades, we've had a very, very significant increase in the number of Central Pacific El Nino events, which are the weaker type events. And, it, and um, a, uh, you know, uh, much fewer, much lower frequency of events of the Eastern Pacific El Nino events, but when they do occur, they're much, much stronger. Remember that the ocean is absorbing most of the heat from global warming. You know, 93% of the heat is going into the ocean. So these type of um, internal variability events, the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation events, are a way that the ocean, after it accumulates lots of heat near the equator, it, 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 it releases this heat 